Action! I don't understand this cat. Pretending like he no karate. Pretending like he could be a sex machine. Like a little kid playing dress up. Eddie Murphy has been in the spotlight for decades, which means that most people are familiar with the main highlights of his life. After all, he was on top of his game in the 80s, acting on SNL, doing impressive stand-up comedy, and making some of the best comedies of that era. However, there are some lesser known facts about this hilarious celebrity, touching on areas like his childhood, his bumps in the road to success, and his foray into a singing career. What's funny is that his most popular music hit Party All The Time produced by Rick James was actually a $100,000 bet between himself and Richard Pryor wagering on whether Murphy had singing talent or not. Well, Murphy definitely won because it reached number two on the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks and made it the lead single from Murphy's 1985 debut album, How Could It Be? What's funny is that I keep hearing this song on the radio and only recently found out that it was Eddie Murphy singing it. That being said, this is the third video in my Eddie Murphy retrospective. The first two videos look back at the actor's career from the 80s throughout the 90s. This video will look back at the iconic comedic actor from the 2000s to current times. So without any further ado, let's look back at Eddie Murphy in modern day cinema. After the success of the original Nutty Professor and still wanting to remain in the family-friendly genre, Murphy reprised his role as Professor Sherman Klump. Unlike the first film, Nutty Professor 2 received unfavorable reviews from critics. Adjectives such as obnoxious, lowbrow, bloated, and unfunny cropped up frequently in reviews. In contrast to the previous film, subplots which are centered on the parents of protagonist Sherman Klump occupy a substantial part of the film. Members of the Klump family, including Sherman's parents, also provide an increased level of comic relief. This movie, even though its sequel felt like a bad parody of the original, milking on the fact that Eddie Murphy had to play multiple characters and being in intricate costumes. In Nutty Professor 2, Sherman Klump is getting married much to the delight of his family. Unfortunately, Buddy Love, the narcissist alter ego from the first film, is back and starts creating chaos in Klump's life. Buddy keeps resurfacing in untimely outbursts and threatening the portly professor's marriage plans to colleague Denise Gaines. Utilizing Denise's cutting-edge DNA research, Sherman decides to rid himself of his monstrous nemesis and his disruptive outbursts once and for all by extracting Buddy's DNA from his system. But Buddy bursts full-bodied into Sherman's world and lays claim to the professor's astounding invention, a revolutionary youth serum. Desperate to keep it from Buddy, Sherman hides the serum in the Clump family home, thinking it will be safe, which creates even more chaos. Even though this film wasn't successful, it still didn't really stop him from working on more family movies such as Doolittle 2 or even lending his voice in the animated series The PJs. Then he followed these by even more family-friendly safe movies such as The Adventures of Pluto Nash, I Spy, and another terrible movie called Daddy Daycare. These were all fine and dandy projects, with some of them being definite cash grabs. Speaking of bad movies, the next film that impacted me the most was the not-so-great movie called The Haunted Mansion, which was released in 2003 and is based on a ride of the same name located in the various Disney-themed parks. On a fun note, this was the first film to air on the Disney Channel to contain any profanity besides hell or damn. It also contained the phrase Big Ass Termites, uttered by Jim when he sees the breathing door. In this movie, we follow a workaholic real estate agent, Jim Evers, played by Eddie Murphy, who is accused by his wife of neglecting his son and daughter. In order to fix that, he takes his whole family on vacation, and along the way, they stop off at a sinister mansion that Jim has been asked to sell, only to discover it's haunted by Master Gracie, his stern butler, Ramsley, and two other servants who need some help breaking a curse. Upon its release, this movie was heavily criticized and did moderately at the box office grossing $182.3 million worldwide on a $90 million budget. Even though he re-lent his voice for the donkey in 2004's Shrek and subsequently again in 2007 for Shrek the Third, Murphy's next acting roles really didn't do him justice acting in yet more family-friendly movies such as Norbit, Me Dave, and Imagine That. 
The only one movie of that era that really stood out was Dreamgirls, which was released in 2006, and he was far from being the title role in the movie. Dreamgirls tells the story of a trio of female soul singers who cross over to the pop charts in the early 1960s, facing their own personal struggles along the way. Murphy's character is called James Thunder, who is inspired by R&B soul singers such as James Brown, Jackie Wilson, and Marvin Gaye, who is a raucous performer on the Rainbow label engaged in an adulterous affair with Dreams member Laurel. Murphy won a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor as well as a Screen Actors Guild Award and a Broadcast Film Critics Association Award in that category for that role. The next movie from that era that is worth speaking about came in 2011 with Tower Heist. The idea for Tower Heist began development as early as 2005 when Murphy pitched a concept to producer Brian Grazer and Ratner concerning an all-star cast of black comedians as a group of disgruntled employees who plan to rob Donald Trump and Trump International Hotel and Tower. The film was originally titled Trump Heist under this concept. Feeling the original concept was too close to Ocean's Eleven, Ratner attempted to recruit Rush Hour screenwriter Nathanson but ended up hiring Griffin, a writer on the Ocean's Eleven remake. Griffin brought the real motivation and the heart to the concept. Moving away from the premise of performing an ensemble heist on a rich Donald Trump type and focusing instead on a group of blue collar employees who take on a corrupt thieving businessman who has embezzled their pensions. In the movie Tower Heist, the manager of a high rise condo, Josh Kovacs, has a good relationship with the tenants, especially financier Arthur Shaw. When Shaw is arrested for fraud, Josh thinks it's a misunderstanding that can be resolved, but later he learns that the employee's pension fund, which he asks Shaw to handle, is gone. When one of the employees tries to kill himself, Josh's views of Shaw change. He goes to see him and loses his temper at his job. An FBI agent tells him Shaw might just walk and recovering the funds is unlikely. She tells him it's been rumored that Shaw has 20 million lying around if he needs it in a hurry. Josh thinks he knows where it is, so Josh along with two other fired employees, an evicted tenant and a criminal acquaintance set out to get into Shaw's and get the money. The film received mixed reviews from critics with praise going to the cast including Broderick, Leone and Stiller. Murphy's performance was repeatedly singled out with critics feeling that he displayed a welcome return to the comedic style of his early career. Much of the criticism was focused on the plot, which was considered formulaic, rushed and dull. Even though Murphy was somewhat back in the spotlight with this movie, it would be another couple of years until he would actually have a real substantial role. This role came with the movie Mr. Church. Originally this movie was meant to star Samuel L. Jackson, but later that year Eddie Murphy was hired to take over Jackson's role due to scheduling conflicts. Although it was unlike the comedy films Murphy was known for, he accepted to work on the film because it was something he hadn't done before. And I'm really glad that he did because it really is, in my opinion, the first good movie he had done in the past 10 to even 15 years. Even though some stuff he had done in the 2000s was enjoyable, nothing really stood out like his early 80s and 90s fame. Mr. Church tells the story of Charlotte Brooks who lives with her single mother Mary Brooks in California. One morning Charlie awakes the sound and delicious smells of cooking wafting in from the kitchen. Upon inspection Charlie is shocked to find a strange black man preparing breakfast. Her mother informs her that the man is Mr. Church and he will be their new cook. Convinced that Mr. Church would intrude on the life she shared with her mother, Charlie is initially distrustful of Mr. Church and urges her mother to fire him. Mary learns that Mr. Church was hired by Richard Cannon, a wealthy entrepreneur she dated until she learned he was married. When Cannon died, he left provisions in his will that provided financial support for Mary, who was diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. The provisions were slated to last for six months to match her diagnosed life expectancy. When Mr. Church informs Mary that he was guaranteed a lifetime salary to care for the family, she decides to keep Mr. Church as their cook on the condition that he keeps her cancer a secret from Charlie. Six years later, Mary is still living and Mr. Church has become a comfortable fixture in the household for both Charlie and her mother. 
What started out as a six month arrangement instead spans into 15 years and even after Mary dies, Mr. Church remains there for Charlie as a true family member. Mr. Church received negative reviews from critics which is really surprising because I felt that this was probably one of his best performances and I would love to see him in more dramatic roles. In 2019, Eddie Murphy released Rudy Ray Moore's biopic My Name is Dolomite. This project started in 2003 when Murphy arranged a meeting between two writers, Scott Alexander and Larry Karzowski, who were able to interview Moore who told them many of his life stories before his death in 2008. However, the early attempts to make the film never came to fruition. On June 7, 2018, it was announced that Craig Brewer would direct Dolomite Is My Name with Netflix producing and distributing it. Eddie Murphy was set to star as Moore and later that month the rest of the principal cast was announced. Nicholas Joseph von Sternberg, the director of photography of the original Dolomite, visited the set during filming and according to Brewer contributed additional stories that didn't make it into the film. Dolomite Is My Name tells the story of performer Rudy Ray Moore who develops an outrageous character named Dolomite and becomes an underground sensation and star of a kung fu anti-establishment film that could make or break Moore. This movie was actually the first really positive success that he had in years. In 2020, the long-awaited sequel to Coming to America came out. Principal photography began on August 17, 2019 in Atlanta, Georgia. Rick Ross confirmed during the same month that his Georgia mansion would be used as a location in the film. In the sequel movie, the African monarch Akeem learns he has a long lost son in the United States and must return to America to meet this unexpected heir and build a relationship with his son. Sensing that trouble is brewing in the African kingdom of Zamunda, three long and prosperous decades after Prince Akeem and Lisa McDowell's opulent wedding in the original Coming to America, King Jaffe Jofer and Sam and I drop the bombshell. As a result, with three lovely daughters and no sons, it seems that Prince Akeem is with his back to the wall as General Izzy, the megalomaniac despot of the neighboring country of Nexdoria, dreams of seizing power through a political marriage of convenience. Now King Akeem and his trusted confidant Semi have to return where it all began, the bustling borough of Queens, New York to retrieve Lavelle, the illegitimate son and suspecting Akeem never knew existed. When General Izzy learns of this, he drops by to introduce his daughter Popoto to Lavelle as a last shot at laying claim to the throne of Zemunda, but in order to qualify as a royal prince, Lavelle first has to pass a series of traditional and hazardous tests. Lavelle is at first highly reluctant to place himself in danger, but then bonds with Marembe, a royal groomer who tells him of Akeem's quest to find his queen and encourages him to follow his own path. Reviews for this movie were really mixed, but personally I actually enjoyed it and it shows that even after all of these years, Eddie Murphy still has it in him to be a leading man. The major problem that I've seen in a lot of Murphy's work is that he's almost become too big of a star. It's kind of like his stories and characters are just there to outshine one another and by being so they become less funny. At the same time, all these sequels, even though the originals were funny, make them once again crowd pleasers that don't really make anybody happy. In some ways, I really hope that Eddie Murphy can get into more roles such as Mr. Church, where it's not necessarily a cash grab but more so a lovely story that isn't there to simply please the audience and make as much money as possible but actually tell a good story. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Leave me a comment too. Let me know what your favorite Murphy movie was from the past two decades. Have a great day and I'll see you guys in the next video.